Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington. We begin with breaking news out of Perry, Iowa, where law enforcement officials and the governor are holding a press conference right now after a shooter opened fire at a high school earlier this morning, injuring at least two students and a school administrator. Let's listen in to the governor. We can say saved lives. The response was tremendous, and we're extremely grateful. The full resources of the state government will be available to assist in the response and, of course, the community's recovery from this tragic event. The mental health region uh, has social workers that are embedded in the school district and will provide counseling services for the students, the families, and the staff. As you all know, this is an ongoing investigation, so law enforcement will brief you only on what they can at this time and they will provide additional information as it becomes available. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chief, to the Chief. Thank you. I'm Chief Eric Vaughn from the Perry Police Department. I want to thank the quick actions of the Dallas County dispatchers who handled and dispatched the calls regarding this traffic, tragic event this morning. I also want to recognize the initial officers from the Perry and Dallas County Sheriff's Office and their actions on scene. Thank you to the massive response from agencies throughout the area, including EMS, for their assistance today. It is truly amazing to see first responders work together in these crisis situations. And I cannot forget to recognize the teachers, faculty, and students involved who acted bravely and heroically in this tragic situation. Thank you to the community support we have seen and we will continue to need in the future. All of our condolences to the victims and their families. They need your thoughts and prayers as well as time and space to process and to grieve. This community has been through tough times before and have rallied together. I'm sure this time will be no different. Thank you. Introduce Mitch Mortvet. Thank you, Chief. My name is Mitch Mortvet. I'm an assistant director with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. At 7:37 a.m., <clears throat> excuse me, on January 4th, 2024, the Perry Police Department responded to an active shooter event at Perry High School. Meanwhile, Dallas County Communications was also receiving multiple 911 calls of an active shooter at the high school. Perry police officers responded within minutes. They immediately made entry and witnessed students and faculty either sheltering in place or running from the school. <clears throat> Once inside, they located multiple individuals with gunshot wounds. Officers immediately attempted to locate the source of the threat and quickly found what appeared to be the shooter with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. As additional officers responded, a systematic approach search of the school took place. Officers located during the search of the school an improvised explosive device. The state fire marshal and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms rendered the device safe. Numerous officers from multiple agencies were able to secure the school and verify no additional threats. At the same time, first responders were rendering aid to the victims who were later transported to area hospitals. The shooter has been identified as 17-year-old Dylan Butler, a student at Perry High School. Butler was armed with a pump action shotgun and a small caliber handgun. Butler also made a number of social media posts in and around the time of the shooting. Law enforcement is working to secure those pieces of evidence. All evidence thus far suggests that Butler acted alone. There are six victims, one of them who is deceased. That individual was a sixth grade student at Perry Middle School. The other five are being treated at area hospitals. Four of the surviving 
student, four of the victim, surviving victims are students, and the fifth is a school administrator. The law enforcement response was swift and immediate. Roughly 150 officers from local, state, and federal agencies responded within the hour. The investigation in today's tragedy is ongoing. The Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation is serving as the lead investigative agency with assistance from the Perry Police Department, the Dallas County Sheriff's Office, the FBI, the ATF, and the Dallas County Attorney's Office. At this time, we will take a few questions. Uh, Mitch, uh, Tell the from the register. Yeah. Um, I was told by the father of a student who was shot that his son witnessed Principal Dan Marburger be shot. Is he the administrator? What is his condition? The investigation's ongoing, and we're not releasing any other names other than Dylan Butler's name at this time. Can you give us any indication as to motive for this? I know this is ongoing. But... Anything into the background of him is part of the investigation, and we're obviously going to take a deep dive into that, but there's nothing that we can release at this time. Yeah, Where would you give us the status of the other uh, five uh, people who are in the hospital or the state where they critical? It, at this time, it's my understanding as of about, I should say, as of about an hour ago, one was in critical condition but appeared not to be life-threatening, and the other four are stable. Is any racial motivation in this shooting and... Are there any Latino victims? As far as the ethnicity of the victims, I'm not sure. Um, and there's nothing to indicate at this time that it had anything to do with race. Um, as far as motive, again, that's part of the background investigation, and that's something that we're continuing to look into. Sir, excuse me, there's a video online. Is there any, uh, any credibility to this video naming this man as the shooter? I haven't seen the video and that I don't know at this time, but we are, law enforcement is working to secure um, those pieces of evidence, as I mentioned in the statement. So there's nothing more that we can comment on about that. This is the first time that we've heard uh, someone from the middle school being involved in the shooting. Do you have an idea as to the path this, uh, this suspect took? It, it, all, it all happened in the uh, Perry High School and it was before school started, so there were not many students, and it's our understanding that there was a breakfast program going on, so there may have been students of, of different grades, if you will, in the school at that time. But it all was contained in the Perry High School, not in any of the other buildings. How many shots fired weapons? That's still part of the investigation. We're trying to determine that. How sophisticated you was the IED? The explosive device? I'm, I'm sorry, one of you? The explosive device? Yes. What else can you tell us? I, not much about it, other than it was uh, pretty rudimentary and it was rendered safe by, like I said, the state fire marshal and the ATF. Can I ask a question to the governor? Um, given that the investigation is ongoing and this is a local and state matter, you know, however, the eyes of the world are on Iowa uh -huh. over the next 11 days. How should the candidates running for president talk about what happened? To well, the I'll let them... Yeah, I'll let them decide how they're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to focus on the investigation, and we're going to focus on making sure that we provide the resources that the community, the teachers, the staff, those that are involved, the families, that we're providing the resources that they need during this difficult time. So that's what I'm going to be focused on, the state of Iowa is going to be focused on, and I'll let the candidates decide what they're going to focus on. Don't worry, they Thank you. politicize it. We're going to take no more questions at this time. What, what does the Thank school, you. For school safety for other schools in the area that we're looking at this year, what does school safety look like going forward here in Iowa? I mean, as, as it was commented on um, by the chief that and by the governor as well, that, uh, um, you know, everybody reacted the way they should. And, and it's obvious that training, first of all, at the school level, you know, with faculty and students, um, everybody reacted absolutely appropriately the way they should, as well as law enforcement as they are entering the building. Yeah. Yeah. Is this a suspect had a suspect with a gunshot? Is this a suspect dead? Thank you. Is this a suspect dead? Is the suspect deceived? You have been listening to a press conference, law enforcement, the governor of Iowa there responding after a school shooting there. We are learning new details. According to law enforcement officials, there were six victims of that shooting, including one sixth grade student who has died. Five people still in the hospital. Uh, four of them are students. One is a school administrator. 
Officials identifying the suspect as 17-year-old Dylan Butler. They say he was a student at the school. They also say that law enforcement officials found an IED on site at the school this morning. Once that shooting unfolded, they say the calls started coming in at about 7.30 a.m. They say that that has now been rendered non-threatening. They also say that the suspect has also passed away. He killed himself, apparently, of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. I want to bring in NBC's Ali Vitale, who's going to join us in just a moment. But I also want to bring in NBC News terrorism contributor and retired ATF special agent in charge, Jim Cavanaugh. Uh, Ali, I see you are now in front of the camera, so let me, in fact, go to you first. Uh, you could hear the emotion in the voices of the law enforcement officials. Understandably, uh, this is a school shooting that undoubtedly has devastated that community. What were your key takeaways from the press conference? Devastated the community, Kristen, and I have to tell you that as I've been here all day, everywhere that I go, we stopped for coffee, we stopped for lunch at various places throughout this community. We've seen members of the community checking in on each other, uh, some bringing sandwiches by the high school, trying to support law enforcement who were still here working at the scene. Others, you passed high school students, parents of high school students saying that they were just happy to see their friends, students' faces alive and, and okay. That's really what's happening here around this community as everyone is grappling with the reality of this. I mean, four days into the new year, the first day that they've been back after winter break, and classes hadn't even officially started yet. Of course, we already knew that from this morning's press conference. It was clear that this was something that happened before the fir first bell even rang here at Perry High School. But we did learn some pretty devastating new pieces of information especially the fact that not just the shooter is dead, but the fact that there is one other casualty here and that the victim is a sixth grader. It's really just so sobering to hear that as a detail. Of course, other people are injured. They did not expect those people to have life-threatening injuries, but it does underscore the fact that even though there is an eerie sense of calm returning to the scene here, this community is going to have so many pieces left to pick up emotionally as they support each other through this time. I think the other thing that we learned here in this press conference that we hadn't yet heard is the fact that there was an explosive device. Law enforcement officials said that it was deemed safe, that it was pretty rudimentary, but that is something that was notable as well. It's been a slow trickle, frankly, Kristen, of information here on the ground in Perry. I think law enforcement both trying to protect the victims and make sure that their families were spoken to before they briefed media. But it has been a pretty slow stream of information, this latest press briefing, giving us at least a better sense of what happened here today. But certainly this is a community that is reeling and will be for some time. Ali, you made so many great points there, and I think you're right, and you could feel the fact that this is a community that has been torn apart by this. Jim, let me bring you into this conversation. A lot of questions to ask you. First, let's start with what we know about these kids who were the victims of this shooting, this sixth grader whose life was taken, the cruelty of this, here we are again, just a few days into the new year, talking about yet another school shooting, Jim. Yeah, it's horrible. A sixth grader, you just you just got to sit down and comprehend that. It just really, it just really shocks you. I think you could see it on the chief's face when he was trying to give the briefing. Uh, this happened in the high school, Kristen, as has been reported by Ali all day. Uh, but yet, yet there was a gathering of students from other nearby uh, the school, the middle school. So that's probably why there's a sixth grader. They had a large cafeteria uh, there, so there was a mixture. And we have a shooter, a killer, 17 years old, cannot legally buy a long gun, which is a pump shotgun is a long gun, cannot legally buy a handgun and he had, from a dealer, and he had both. Mm. So he came in with two guns that, you know, the question's gonna arise, and I'm sure ATF and the detectives on the scene are, I've already traced those guns. That's going to be a key point. A lot of the school shooters, when they're students, bring the guns from home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we talk about how to reduce them, you know, if all the parents in all America would lock their guns up, we would have a lot less of this. Mm -hmm. But we can't seem to get that to happen. But nevertheless, 
The 17-year-old goes in. He has a pump shotgun, which is a devastating weapon. I mean, this is a police weapon I carried as a uniformed officer and an agent. And if it's used correctly uh, against an adversary, it's devastating. Uh, so something happened here mm. where we don't have more carnage when you have a weapon like that. And he also had a handgun, and he had some rudimentary uh, IED, improvised explosive device. We don't know if that was on him or if he tossed it. But uh, the state fire marshal and ATF rendered it safe. We also don't know if an administrator tried to stop him, Kristen. They haven't really given us those facts. Um, so it's going to be interesting. You know, did he fire the shotgun from a quite a long range, like maybe when he just went in the door? Of course, the pellets will scatter. Uh, and depending on the type of buckshot one would use is the size of the pellets in the gun. So that can vary. But the pellets scatter and they could hit multiple victims. You know, we don't know. It didn't sound like he got off multiple shots. It seemed like we'd have many more wounded, but it's hard to say. Everybody could have started running. Uh, you know, he then tosses a bomb. You know, he needs about three hands to manipulate all this stuff he's doing, a bomb and a pump shotgun and working the pump and killing himself and, you know, maybe being uh, charged by a teacher or something. So there's some facts to come out, but it, it, it's going to get down to the basic things we see. A kid probably gets the guns from home and comes in and, and starts an attack. Mm -hmm. Jim, you heard uh, law enforcement say that they are still investigating the motive here. At this point in time, they said they have no evidence that points them to believe that this was racially motivated. It was notable, though, that they talked about that IED. As Ali said, they, they described it as rudimentary. But still, what does that tell you about this shooter that there was an IED found at this scene. Does that give you any indication of the extent to which he may have had access to a range of weapons? Right, Kristen. Well, he, he went into a little bit of, you know, 17-year-old planning. He wasn't quite as sophisticated as uh, the killers in Columbine, certainly, who were much more prepared. But he did some planning, obviously, because he had this uh, uh, IED. Uh, and a pump shotgun and a pistol. And uh, so he, he's got this little uh, strategy for himself to go in. He also goes in right at the start of school in the cafeteria where he knows there's a crowd. He's clearly looking for the crowd. And his motivation is open. You know, is it, uh, it's probably not greed or escape. So we're looking at revenge, hate, mm. power. It's within there, uh, you know, is he mad at somebody? Was he humiliated at school? He's clearly suicidal. Mm. I think that's gonna play into it. So the psychological autopsy of him, uh, which will be done by the agents and the detectives going back three to six months to see what's in his life, um, you know, what's been going on with him? Was there problems at school, problems at home? Uh, is he depressed? Uh, has he made suicidal remarks? Did he leave a message? All of these things will come to play, but again, we get back to rudimentary stuff for school security, telling all your parents, lock your guns up. Lock your guns up. Don't think it won't happen to you. It's going to happen in your town. And lock the doors of the school. Here's another case where a student is walking inside the door with a pump shotgun. That's a big weapon. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be able to walk in the door with a pump shotgun. It's harder to hide. Uh, it should be stopped. So basic stuff. <laughs> Ali Vitali and Jim Cavanaugh, thank you both so much for joining us. A devastating uh, day as we enter 2024. And of course, all of this against the backdrop of the Iowa caucuses just about 11 days away. The governor asked how the candidates should respond. She said that is up to them. We will continue to update you with any new developments as we get them. Thank you both so much. We do want to turn now to the other top story of the day. As the White House contends with the Israel-Hamas war and the risk of escalating tensions with Iran, all as President Biden faces domestic pressure over his handling of the war. In a sign of renewed urgency facing the administration, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to leave today for his fourth trip to the region since the war began. Meanwhile, White House national security officials are meeting to discuss a potential U.S. military response to Iranian-backed attacks in the Red Sea. Houthi militants have launched 25 attacks on commercial ships since mid-November, including one today. The U.S. Navy has repeatedly shot down Houthi drones and missiles, and earlier this week sunk three Houthi boats in a dramatic confrontation, killing crew members. 
So on the table, according to two current administration officials, U.S. strikes on Houthi targets inside Yemen. Yesterday, the White House addressing the rising tensions. The United States does not seek conflict with any nation or actor in the Middle East, nor do we want to see the war between Israel and Hamas widen in the region. But neither will we shrink from the task of defending ourselves, our interests, our partners, or the free flow of international commerce. It wasn't the United States who decided to attack commercial shipping in the Red Sea. The Houthis did that. And who are the Houthis backed by? Iran. As I've said before, Iran provided the missiles that the Houthis are using. We are simply in a defensive posture to try to protect that commercial shipping. Now, this all comes amid concerns of escalation with other Iranian proxies, including Hezbollah, as a U.S. envoy is headed to Lebanon to try to defuse tensions after an apparent Israeli strike killed a Hamas leader in Beirut. And then there's the fallout of a pair of deadly blasts in Iran yesterday that killed 85 and injured nearly 300. An ISIS-affiliated group is now claiming responsibility. Iran has tried to blame Israel and the United States, despite evidence suggesting neither country was involved. Meanwhile, the U.S. is pressuring Israel to do more to protect civilians inside Gaza. Today, the State Department saying Secretary Blinken is ready for difficult conversations with his counterparts. We don't expect every conversation on this trip to be easy. There are obviously tough issues facing the region and difficult choices ahead. But the Secretary believes it is the responsibility of the United States of America to lead diplomatic efforts to tackle those challenges head on, and he is prepared to do that in the days to come. But we have been working uh, very hard in this building, throughout the administration, and quietly with uh, allies and partners in the region and throughout the world on what the, the day after ought to look like. Those are going to be some of the toughest conversations, of course, but we're ready to go pursue them. Meanwhile, at home, the president faces pushback over his handling of the conflict as a senior education official resigned and campaign staffers signed an anonymous letter protesting his approach to the war. Joining me now is our team of reporters. Courtney Cuby is at the Pentagon. Ali Rafa is at the White House. And Josh Letterman is on the ground in Tel Aviv. And, Court, I want to start with you and your exclusive reporting that the Biden administration is considering potential options for strikes against the Houthis. What do you make of these discussions? What are the key takeaways and the fact that this has risen to the White House level? So it's indicative of the fact that this is getting the White House's attention. There's no question about that. And it's not just the threat to commercial shipping, uh, which we have seen, as you mentioned, 25 attacks by Houthis into the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb in just over a month's time. Now, the U.S. set up this new maritime mission called Operation Prosperity Guardian, and we heard from the head of U.S. naval forces in the region, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, earlier today, he said that since that task force was stood up on December 18th, even though there have been 1,500 merchant ships, commercial ships that have transited through that area, none of the Houthi attacks, including missiles and drones, have been successful. None have actually struck any of those ships. But, Kristen, the attacks have continued, including the one today that you mentioned, which showed a new capability for the Houthis. They've, they've used drones, anti-ship ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, but this was actually a sea-based drone. So an unmanned uh, drone that, was, that went, according to Brad Cooper, Admiral Cooper, it left Yemen, it transited out 15 miles, and then it detonated. Now, fortunately, it wasn't near any ships at the time, so it caused no damage, no injuries. But it does show that the Houthis are continuing to try to, do, to uh, conduct these attacks against ships. That is why the White House is addressing this, coming up with potential options that include not only what they are doing with this, this maritime task force, but also the potential for strikes inside of Yemen against Houthi targets. And what's really critical here, Kristen, is they are attempting to build more of a coalition. There's a coalition at sea, but they want a coalition that would be helpful or would be responsible for these sorts of attacks. Partners like the British and the U.S. military potentially working together if, in fact, they decide to move forward with these these offensive attacks against the Houthis in Yemen, Kristen. Oh, it's really fantastic reporting, Courtney. I know you'll continue to track that angle. You're also watching the fallout after that strike in Baghdad. What more do you know about that? And, Courtney, you and I have been talking about since the beginning of this war the concerns within the administration that there could be a wider war. What is the concern level at this point, particularly in the wake of yet another attack in Baghdad? 
Yeah, and your lead-in just showed all. I mean, the, the fact that it is really, there are, it is all over the region right now. Baghdad is really interesting, though, Kristen, because this is one of the first times that we that we know of anywhere where the U.S. has taken a strike like this against an Iran, Iranian-backed militia member leader since, uh, since Qasem Soleimani, which was almost exactly four years ago today. Uh, this was someone who the U.S. is saying he was a member of one of these Iranian-backed groups, but the Iraqis have come out very hard condemning this action. In fact, saying that these are the kinds of actions that terrorists would take and really condemning the strike. They are saying that, in fact, this individual was a part of what they call the popular mobilization forces. So essentially under the arm, the broad umbrella of the Iraqi military. So this is a very controversial strike here today, Kristen. All right, Courtney QB covering all of the angles for us. Courtney, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Ali, I want to turn to you over at the White House. The Islamic State, or ISIS, of course, as it is known, has now taken responsibility for that attack in Iran that we were just talking about. Secretary Blinken heading to the region. What is the very latest that you're hearing from your sources at the White House about the agenda of Secretary Blinken? What do they hope he can accomplish while he's there? Yeah, Kristen, well, quickly on that claim of responsibility, we did see uh, National Security Council spokesman Admiral John Kirby asked about this during today's press briefing, and he said the U.S. doesn't have any reason to doubt this claim of responsibility uh, by the Islamic State, but he said he couldn't give any more information on how powerful or how much of a threat the U.S. considers ISIS-K and the Islamic State to be. Uh, Kirby, Kirby suggesting that uh, U.S. is still gathering more intelligence before offering a more comprehensive evaluation of that. But as far as Blinken's trip to this region, it comes, uh, as you heard Courtney lay out, amid a series of escalating attacks, escalating worries that this conflict will widen even further. And the stakes have been raised because of those conflicts. And there's no shortage of focuses on Blinken's to-do list when he goes to this region for uh, roughly the next week. Uh, first and foremost, the State Department says he will be focused on talking about really what the next phase of this war is going to be, how to get those hostages, those remaining hostages out of Gaza, how to uh, ins ensure that the Palestinian people can return to their homes whenever this war does end. How can they ensure that humanitarian aid can continue to flow into Gaza? And notably, Kristen, uh, the State Department, as you heard uh, a spokesperson say in the intro earlier, one of the most difficult discussions that they are anticipating Blinken to have during this trip, uh, both with his Israeli counterparts as well as other leaders in this region, is really what the plan will be for this day after scenario. Who will govern Gaza when this war and is over and how that will eventually work out? Uh, the State Department fully expecting that to be one of the most difficult discussion discussions rather Blinken will have on this trip, Kristen. I think you're absolutely right. It is a question that we continue to put to the administration and there's still no clear answer. Ali Rafa, thank you for all of that great reporting. Josh Letterman, let me turn to you now in Tel Aviv. Uh, obviously, we were just discussing with Courtney and Ali the fact that there have been these other attacks. Uh, what is the feeling right now? How much concern is there inside Israel about a potential miscalculation, about an escalation of a wider war? Huge amount of concern right now, Kristen. Herzl Halevi, the IDF chief of staff, uh, says that they're at an extremely high level of preparedness now uh, for a potential additional front in this war on the northern border with Lebanon. They are uh, alert for potential attacks uh, into a lot in the southern uh, tip of Israel from the Red Sea, uh, where the Houthis have been so active. Uh, they are worried about Syria. But we should also point out, within the political spectrum here in Israel, there's a lot of speculation. Uh, that the government here is kind of itching for a fight with Hezbollah, that in fact this decision uh, to conduct this assassination of a senior Hamas leader in Beirut, in uh, the heart of uh, the Lebanon, a, a country where Hezbollah has a lot of influence and is part of the government, uh, was an effort by Israel to uh, goad Hezbollah into a war because uh, Israel feels that not only is Hamas a threat, but that Hezbollah is even a bigger threat and that as part of this war they need to eliminate eliminate uh, that threat as well. And so uh, the only person who knows what is in Prime Minister Netanyahu's head uh, is Prime Minister Netanyahu. But certainly uh, there is both concern here uh, as well as a lot of consideration uh, to whether some of these other threats in the region uh, might need to be dealt with by Israel as well sooner rather than later.
I think that's going to be one of the toughest questions they have to answer there. Josh, let me ask you also, there were two Americans who were able to make it out of Gaza. What's the very latest there? We just have about a minute left here. So these were not hostages, we should point out. These were people who were in the Gaza Strip uh, when this war started. Uh, they were unable, apparently, to make it out through the Rafah boarding into Egypt, where many other American citizens were able to exit early in the war. And now we know uh, that the Israelis, with help from uh, United States and from Egypt in terms of coordination, uh, was able to safely get uh, those two people out. Uh, they are relatives of a U.S. Uh, military member. Their family is obviously very happy that they are no longer in the Gaza Strip uh, and are now much in much more safer place. Kristen? There's no doubt about that, and obviously hundreds more still trapped there. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Please continue to stay safe. We appreciate it. Good to see you as always. Coming up, it's closing time and one last call for Iowa. We're live in Des Moines with an exclusive interview with Governor Ron DeSantis as he tries to avoid a knockout punch in the Hawkeye State. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Presidential candidates barnstorming across Iowa just 11 days before the caucus reacting to the shooting this morning in Perry. My NBC colleague Dasha Burns and the Des Moines Register's Brianne Perfensteel were sitting down with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as part of our closing argument series just following the shooting. DeSantis said he's been in contact with the state's governor, Kim Reynolds, and talked about his experience in Florida after the school shooting in Parkland. You can watch his full answer online. Dasha and Brianne also asking DeSantis about the trajectory of his campaign in Iowa. That now finds itself fighting with Nikki Haley, well behind Donald Trump in the polls. Take a listen. Here's what he said. What's your message to Iowans who want to know that you have a path beyond Iowa? Because right now you've placed most of your resources into Iowa. You've de-emphasized, you know, airing TV ads in New Hampshire and South Carolina, for example. So what is your path beyond Iowa? Well, it's too early to do South Carolina TV ads. Um, me doing well here will have more impact than South Carolina than if I was running ads now. We are going to do stuff in New Hampshire, so stay tuned for that. I've already uh, committed to doing debates there, so we're in it for the long haul. Don't worry about that. We're in it for the long haul. Iowans have a chance to really have a, I mean, this is one of the most uh, meaningful votes they'll ever cast, and they have a choice. I mean, Donald Trump is running to address his issues. Nikki Haley's running to address her donors' issues. I'm running to address your issues, your family's issues, and this country's issues. And I'll be a president that's focused and disciplined on those issues. You're and then much my promises. You're in the and race the to Nikki Haley than you are to Trump. What happened? Well, no. I mean, first of all, Trump has always been leading in the race. I mean, he's the former president. He's uh, one of the most famous people in there. But you're not even the top there. challenger so to him now. We are the top. Um, they wouldn't be spending that money if we weren't the top. I'm the only one that has a chance to beat Trump and win the general election. Nikki Haley can't get conservative voters. She's not playing to win. In fact, she will not even rule. So most of her support are people that really don't like Donald Trump. She's the darling of the never Trumpers. And yet when she's asked, OK, will you just categorically put this to bed and say you will not accept the vice presidential nomination? She will not answer that question. Again, put all your eggs in the Iowa basket. That's can not true. Can you name another that, state that think you true. could win? That's not true. Can you name another state you could win? Yes, yes. You wait till what, what happens when we get out of Iowa. It's going to create, a, state create a lot win? of. We're going to be able to win a lot of states. We have a great can organization in New Hampshire. We have a great organization in South Do you Carolina. Think you can win New Hampshire? We can have a lot of great organizations throughout Super Tuesday. So you're going to see this is very dynamic. Uh, you're going to see it's a long process, um, and we're going to be able uh, to win. So stay tuned. But to say that we've put all the eggs is not true. Uh, we have great uh, organization and field programs in the early states, uh, and we're going to compete in all of them. Would you consider joining forces with Nikki Haley? For what? To defeat Donald Trump. Is it important enough to you to team up with Haley on a ticket to try to defeat him? I don't think that that would be something that would be viable. I mean, you know, her voters, uh, she has a limited ceiling in the Republican Party. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of my supporters here in Iowa, for example, you know, they, they, they want to move on from Trump. But if they had to choose between Trump or Haley, they probably would go with Trump because his policies are more in line with what they want. Speaking again of Nikki Haley, uh, and you mentioned this in some of your earlier comments, but in a New Hampshire town hall last night, she said that, you know, uh, Iowa starts it, but New Hampshire corrects it. 
Um, do you think New Hampshire is going to correct what Iowa decides? Well, one, I think it's a slap in the face to Iowans to say that they somehow need to be corrected. Uh, it's almost as if, like, she's acknowledging she's not going to do well here, and so she's blaming the voters. Um, you know, that's unacceptable. I think for Nikki Haley to be in a different state and trying to virtue signal uh, in ways that are that diminish uh, the uh, voters of Iowa, um, I think it was, I, honestly, it was a mistake. But, you know, sometimes these gaffes are what people really think. She's phony. You know, she doesn't have core set of convictions. She's coming in here. She's trying to trying to be relatable, but just doesn't get Iowa. And I think that's becoming more and more apparent. And here's the thing. Her, you know, quote, rise was media driven. Um, there's not a lot of grassroots energy. You can talk to all these activists here. They're not seeing it. It's been media driven. But as Republicans, you know, you need to be you need to have a candidate that's going to be able to handle this because you are going to be put through the wood chipper uh, by the corporate press the minute you're going against a Democrat. And she's just not going to be able to handle that. DeSantis was also pressed about his campaign against former President Trump and how the former president's legal jeopardy plays into his strategy. This week, you've been asked by a couple of Iowa Republicans, why aren't you going, going after him more? This is somebody who has 91 criminal uh, felony counts across four indictments. Isn't that something you can drill in on a little harder? The problem with that is if you look at people like Alvin Bragg, who brought some of those, um, if you look at uh, Jack Smith and the Garland Justice Department, those are just not good actors in my judgment. And so uh, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm aligning with people who are politicizing uh, the law now. Practically speaking, Republican voters just have to look at this and say, OK, do we want the election to be about the issues that the American people are facing? Do we want to be able to hold Biden and the Democrats feet to the fire for their failures and offer a way to a better future for Americans? Or do we want the election to be about Donald Trump's conduct? Practically speaking, you, want, you don't want the, refer, the election to be a referendum on Donald Trump and all these issues from the past. That plays into the Democrats' advantage. And just think, look, I, I saw this firsthand when he first got elected. He inspires opposition uh, on the political left, unlike any other person. In fact, he does a better job inspiring Democrats to come out to vote than Democrat candidates are able to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why Biden and the Democrats want to run against Trump, because they can play that playbook into their advantage. So just from a strategic perspective, um, if I'm the nominee, we're going to focus on the issues that are important to the American people. We win when that happens. Do you think there's do you think Donald Trump will go to jail for his alleged crimes? Oh, I don't know, because I just I don't know the, the details on this, but uh, I don't think that would be good for the country. Um, but I also think that, you know, he's in some hostile environments. You know, do we want to put the future of the Republican Party in the hands of a probably an ultra liberal Democrat D.C. jury? Uh, D.C. juries have not been kind to Republicans over the years. I, I don't think a lot of Republicans would want to be in front of that. So I think we're, we're taking a huge risk by empowering uh, a jury, uh, probably an all-Democrat jury in the nation's capital, the most Democrat area in the country, uh, to pass a judgment. Uh, because obviously if they rule against him, uh, if they save a verdict against him, that's going to hurt us in the election. You've said you would pardon former President Trump. Why do you think that's the best decision for the country? Well, I said I'd be willing to do it in order to move the country forward because, um, you know, to, to send an, uh, he's almost 80 year old, to send to prison potentially, uh, is that going to help heal the country or is that just going to exacerbate the divisions in the country? And I think when Ford did that with Nixon, uh, you had a situation where it was not necessarily the popular thing to do, uh, but in hindsight, it was the right thing to do because at some point, you've got to come together and look forward. Uh, I don't want to relitigate all the stuff involving Donald Trump. That is not going to be helpful for this country. And so it's really about what's best for the overall American people. It's less about Donald Trump specifically. To follow that logic, then, if you were in the Oval Office, would you ask Republicans to stand down on investigations of Biden in the spirit of not putting the country through more turmoil? Well, but Biden has not been held accountable for anything. I mean, Trump is facing all these charges. Biden has not faced anything. Um, you know, they haven't even been investigating a lot of the stuff criminally like they have against but Trump. But he's also so there, there 80 been, years old. There have been, also... been different standards of justice that have been applied on these on these investigations because the amount of money that's come into their family, how does that happen where you have millions of dollars that's coming into the family uh, and yet that's not uh, leading to major FBI? I mean, I don't know that the congressional investigation has been very effective. I know they promised things. I don't know how much they've actually delivered on it, but we don't even have, we aren't even scratching the surface on that. 
Joining me now from Des Moines is NBC's Dasha Burns. Great job there to you and Brianne, Dasha. So let's talk about your key takeaways. You pressed him repeatedly, basically, on whether Iowa is make or break. He didn't name another state that he thinks he's going to win. What did you learn, and what were your big takeaways from your interview? Yeah, I mean, look, Kristen, this is a candidate that started out in this race as the top contender uh, to beat Donald Trump, vying for first place. He's now finding himself fighting for second place with Nikki Haley. And I asked him if he would admit to that. And he, of course, uh, had issues with the premise of that question. He said he's not fighting for second place. He pointed to all of the money spent on negative ads against him as evidence for him still being uh, a top dog in this fight. At the same time, as you said there, he had a hard time naming a state uh, after Iowa that he would potentially be able to win. And this is uh, a candidate who has also spent a lot of this interview, uh, even though he said he's not fighting for second place, going after uh, his his right now main opponent, Nikki Haley. And you can see in the ad spending, uh, in the focus from his team, the amount of time and energy that they are fighting, spending to fight uh, Haley at the same time as they are also trying to take some punches at Trump. He really sharpened his tone and and stepped up his attacks against Haley in this interview in a way that we haven't heard yet. And he did take a sharper tone with Trump as well, as you heard there when it comes to his legal troubles, Kristen. Yeah, and you heard him called Nikki Haley phony. I thought that was certainly uh, underscores that point you're making, that he's really trying to toughen his tone. I know you asked him about January 6th as well. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I want you to take a listen to his answer on January 6th, and we'll talk on the other side. What lessons did the country learn from January 6th? What did you also personally take away from that day? Well, look, I mean, it, it, I think it's been politicized um, by the left. Um, you know, I don't think it was supposed to be. It, what, that was not supposed to happen. I think people went to protest, and I think it got out of hand. Um, but uh, I it's think... It's something that happened to our nation. What do you think we can take away from it? I don't. I think that's more of a media with the anniversary. I know that this is a, like Christmas Day for the media, like to talk about January sixth. I know it's a big deal um, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the corporate outlets. I get that. I've not had a single question in Iowa um, about January sixth. I mean, I've taken hundreds and hundreds of questions. Uh, I think people are focused, looking forward. So I'm not going to spend time, you know, in my campaign either now or in the general election, you know, talking about. Um, you know, rehashing that. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of energy that's got into it. Um, I'll let Donald Trump handle that. I mean, I know he was, um, you know, president during then. I know some of his supporters got caught up in this who, you know, were, were just basically there, didn't necessarily do anything violent, and they've now got caught up in the law. He was not willing to give them any type of legal protection or clemency on the way out the door. Now he says he would do it, but I think that's probably too little too late. And Kristen, yeah, a really striking answer there. And look, you know, when I talk to voters out here, out on the campaign trail about January 6th, you do get quite a range of answers. I mean, there are people who have left the Republican Party because of what happened that day, people who will never uh, be able to put their names next to Donald Trump on a ballot uh, again uh, because of that day. And then there are others who feel similarly to what you just heard from Governor DeSantis. And he, of course, has been trying to push himself over the course of this campaign to the right of Donald Trump, try to play to those uh, voters who are farther and farther on the right of the political spectrum. And uh, that's what you heard him play to there. Yeah, just a, a fascinating interview uh, with Governor Ron DeSantis. Dasha Burns, great, great work. Thank you so much. I know you're not done. You're back tomorrow with the first look at your exclusive interview with former governor and U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. We look forward to talking to you then. Dasha, thank you for that. Joining me now on set is Molly Ball, senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal, Cornell Belcher, Democratic pollster and NBC News political analyst, and Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and also an NBC News political analyst. Happy New Year to all of you. Here we are in 2024. Thank you for joining me today. Molly, let me start with you and just get your reaction to everything we just heard from Governor DeSantis. I mean, it's striking to hear him say, people here in Iowa don't ask me about January 6th. As Dasha said, people talk about it. I was in Iowa. Folks talked to me about it and said they broke with Donald Trump over that. What were your big takeaways from what you just heard from him? 
Yeah, there, I mean, there was so much. But I uh, in that answer and in so many others, what struck me was just the subtlety of this dance that Ron DeSantis is trying to do, right? You heard him there trying to triangulate, try to draw a wedge between Trump and his supporters by sort of pointing out, like, oh, he's defending the January 6th rioters now. But what? where was he, you know, on his way out the door when he actually could have done something for them, trying to question his commitment to the January 6th rioters, but at the same time, not at all criticize him for what happened or, or what uh, or what he did that day, very similar to uh, the answer about the indictments, mm -hmm. right? Where he's saying, well, I'm not going to uh, actually criticize him for any of the things that he did because those are the things that Democrats criticize him for and I don't want to be perceived as on their side. And you just see the effectiveness of uh, Trump's technique of polarization, of divide and conquer, where Trump has positioned himself so you're either with him or against him, and there is no in-between, and that has meant that for Ron DeSantis, trying to find that space in-between to say to people, I still love Trump, but aren't I better in all of these ways, it just has not been a viable message. Yeah, Stephen, what's been so striking about it is that here we are 11 days from the Iowa caucuses, and we are just really starting to see him find new ways to try to sharpen his tone, even as Molly rightfully yeah. points out, he's doing this very delicate dance of not going all the way, going the full right. Christie, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's subtle, it's, it's nuanced, but it's also just incoherent. I mean, yeah. I think what we've seen in those answers is the reason that Ron DeSantis has fallen in the polling and is no longer Donald Trump's chief rival. Mm. He's trying to have it both ways on virtually everything and contradicting himself sometimes in the space of each sentence. I mean, he talks about how he doesn't want to smear Donald Trump. He doesn't believe in that. He's not going to fall for that. It's a media game. And yet at the same time, he, he's willing to say that Nikki Haley's a phony, that she's bought and paid for by Wall Street. I mean, he's smearing Nikki Haley, but he's not smearing mm. Donald Trump. That just tells you, I think, where his allegiance lies. And in the question about, you know, Donald Trump, whether Ron DeSantis would team up with Nikki Haley mm -hmm. to take on Donald Trump. And he said, well, you know, my supporters are probably going to be where Donald Trump is. I think that was a very okay. revealing answer, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps unintentional. I, I think so as well. And the other revealing moment, Cornell, I thought was he really struggled. In fact, he didn't name another state that he thought he could win. Right. And oh, by the way, Trump's ahead by 37 points in right. Iowa. Right. And, and he said, it was striking to me, he said, I'm in for the long haul. Yeah. And he, but he's not, right? Take it, I mean, you don't have to be a campaign professional hack like I am to understand that <laughs> what has happened, he has burnt through an alarming amount of money mm. in a short period of time, which is, which is just malpractice for any campaign. He's now struggling with, with, with funding. He's had to pull back advertising from, 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 from key states, and he's focused now on one state. So he's, so he's, so he's, out, of, so he's out of funds, and, he's, and his polling numbers are, are, are collapsing. He's not in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. I suspect that if he does not come in a, 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 a close second to Nikki Haley in Iowa, we will not see him very much longer on the campaign trail. I, I think that you're right, that Iowa is going to force all of these candidates to ask themselves some really yes. tough questions. I want to turn to the current president, President Biden. He's going to be delivering a speech on democracy tomorrow in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. He is out with a new campaign ad. His speech tomorrow is going to focus on democracy. This ad focuses on democracy. I'm going to play a little bit, and we'll talk about it on the other side. There's something dangerous happening in America. There's an extremist movement who does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. All of us are being asked right now, what will we do to maintain our democracy? History's watching. The world is watching. The most important, our children and grandchildren will hold us responsible. Cornell, what do you make of this messaging? What do you make of this strategy? It worked in 2020. You could argue it worked in 2022 as well. 2022 as well, as well yes. Yeah. I, I would argue that it, did, it, it helped push back the tide. Look, a lot of people questioned when, when, when the president went to the, and I think he went to Philadelphia and yeah. he made the democracy speech then. He got was criticized. He got time. criticized. Yeah. And they should shut up. Those people who criticize them <laughs> because him interjecting democracy and making democracy a key issue in that election helped turn the tide. Campaigns are are actually not that difficult. You know, on, each candidate wants to determine what they want the debate to be about, right? And what what this president is saying, what he wants this debate to be about, 
is democracy and freedoms. Because if that's what the debate's about, they like their chances. This was a this was a really good ad, and it's a mm. really important point in time for their Biden campaign. Stephen, are Republicans getting jittery when they look at an ad like that, when they think about the issue of abortion, where a, a lot of Republican strategists acknowledge there's still no clear message when it comes to that issue that's critical to a lot of voters? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this ad and this sort of broader messaging has two advantages. One, it riles up the Democratic base. I mean, it reminds the Democratic base yeah. sort of what's at stake or the way that Joe Biden wants to frame what's at stake. The other thing it does is it appeals to people who, like the gentleman who asked the question of Ron DeSantis in Iowa yesterday, mm. and DeSantis said he never gets questions about that. That gentleman asked about the November 2020 election mm. and talked about Donald Trump lying about having won the election. It does matter to some group of people. And what it says to those people who are not probably very excited about Joe Biden as a second term president, it says to them, this matters more. And I think that's a pretty powerful argument for some independents and for some Republicans who are frustrated with Donald Trump. Molly, we're having this uh, discussion against the backdrop of a new poll which shows that a third of Republican voters believe the FBI organized or encouraged the January 6th attack on the Capitol, even though, of course, that's not the case. <laughs> How compelling of an argument is this? And what are we in for if we are in for this rematch between Biden and Trump? I mean, what struck me more than anything about that ad was the sense of continuity with Biden's mm. 2020 campaign. There was a clip in there of Charlottesville. Yes. And that was, Joe Biden said, the reason he ran in 2020. And it's still the reason he's running, because he sees this twilight struggle for the soul of the nation. And he believes we are still in it as long as we are still, as he is still up against Donald Trump. And so that, that is something that fundamentally has not changed. He said recently uh, at a fundraiser that he might not even be running if Trump mm. wasn't still in the race. And I think you see a, a, a real authenticity here. Now, the, that one third of Republicans certainly aren't going to find it believable. And Trump has done a very good job of, uh, of making this a partisan issue and convincing a lot of his supporters uh, to believe his lies about the 2020 election and the January 6th riot. Uh, but for Biden, you can tell that this is still the animating issue driving his campaign. And the question is just, do enough Americans still see this the way he does? That is the key question. And this conversation will continue with 11 days to go until Iowa. Thank you so much for a great conversation, Molly Cornell and Stephen. And after the break, the battle over ballot access is ramping up as former President Trump appeals another case to the Supreme Court. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We have a few developments to tell you about in Donald Trump's efforts to remain on the primary ballot in all 50 states and out of the courtroom. Today, the former president's legal team sought to halt the former president's federal election interference trial, telling the judge special counsel Jack Smith should be held in contempt for violating a stay in the case by continuing to file motions. Yesterday, Mr. Trump asked the Supreme Court to overturn Colorado's Supreme Court's decision declaring him ineligible to appear on its primary ballot because of his actions tied to January 6th. NBC News justice reporter Ryan Riley joins me now. Ryan, good to see you. Happy New Year. Thanks Happy for being year. here. So let's start with the first part of that. On what grounds is the former president asking that Jack Smith be held in contempt? Is that realistic? You know, well, for one, I think they want to see headlines with Jack Smith and contempt in them, right? That's essentially one of the reasons for this. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any chance, really, that the judge would hold them in contempt. And that's really because prosecutors telegraphed this specifically even before she put the case in, uh, on hold. Last month, three days before that filing, they actually said, we are going to continue to meet these deadlines. Essentially, they're turning in their homework early, and that's what they want them to be held in contempt for. Uh, Donald Trump is under no obligation to respond to any of the filings that they're making. But mm -hmm. basically, this case will likely go back to the court, and they want to try to keep it on schedule as much as possible because this is really all about the clock. That's what this case is in the end when this case takes place, if it can take place before the next. And the clock is running out actually quite quickly, less than a year now. Um, what happens with Trump's, what happens next, I should say, with the former president's appeal of Colorado's Supreme Court's efforts to keep him off of the ballot? Yeah, the Supreme Court's going to be really busy with Trump cases this coming year, but I think their legal experts sort of are diverge and disagree on how exactly they're going to handle this and how, ex how quickly they're going to handle this, essentially. But a lot of the deadlines are really looming because you've got to get those ballots printed before they actually uh, take before the election actually takes place. So I think there's going to be an expedited uh, hearing of this, but we're not sure exactly when because we are in uncharted territory, as we will be for much of 2020. When you say expedited, are we talking weeks, months? Yeah, I mean, if they wanted to meet the 
printing deadline, they would need to do this you know, basically in the next couple of weeks, take this case up. And I think that that's, you know, the, the Supreme Court in Colorado put this on hold specifically because they knew that the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, was going to take this up in the end. So this was sort of planned out. But, you know, the Supreme Court is ultimately going to be deciding a lot of these issues as we go into the 2024 presidential election. All right, Ryan Riley, thank you so much. Really appreciate your great reporting, as always. And thank you for being with us this hour. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.